Okay, it says it's, let's see. Yep, it's recording, okay. Very good, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar here for the Southwest Division and the San Diego Divisions combined. Today we have Dr. Greg Steinberg gonna be our speaker for us. Greg is a well-respected worldwide performance psychologist. He is a professor at Austin P State University He's published several books. One is The Mental Rules of Golf, one is Flying Lessons, and one is Full Throttle. Flying Lessons isn't about flying, but it's about helping children with confidence and competence. And The Full Throttle, it offers 122 strategies to supercharge your work performance. So he's a well-respected speaker, 30 years of experience with emotional mastery. Where was he when I was on the tennis tour? Because I needed that to win some more matches back in the old day. So he's worked with PGA pros, NFL, NBA, and tennis pros. And now he's bringing his experience and his expertise to the USPTA pros. So let's uh, hear it for Dr. Greg Steinberg. Thank you, Don. Hey. I, um, I just want to tell you when Don asked me to, to speak to your group, uh, I jumped at the chance because I love to talk, just ask my wife, but more importantly, I, I love to share my knowledge about uh, mental toughness. So you can see tonight's talk is about the five fundamentals of mental toughness in tennis. Uh, and it's my goal uh, to share with you my 30 years of experience, um, not only on the tennis court, but not only in the classroom, uh, but also my consulting work. And uh, just so you get to know a little bit about me, uh, let me just tell you, um, 30 years ago, not even 30, more than 30 years ago, uh, I played competitive tennis and that's me. Uh, you can see that's a hair don't. Uh, I still got some of that. Um, we, you know, of course we used wooden rackets back then. Look at the cars. So this was probably like 1979. Um, and uh, I played competitive tennis, you know, all over Southern Cal, uh, was ranked. Um, and so I, I know a lot of the, the experiences of a competitive tennis player. I know what it feels like to get anxious, and I know what it feels like to be in the zone. Um, and some of those I'm, I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, but I was always fascinated when I played tennis uh, why some people could, um, you know, fall apart in an instant uh, when they had a, a tough break, and other people could raise their game. And so I really made it a life's journey to really understand mental toughness. Um, and so uh, just a little background, I went to UC Santa Barbara, go Gauchos, um, and I studied psychology there. Then I went to Florida State, uh, and I went to University of Florida. Everybody asked me who I root for, and it depends on what year uh, the, the better football team is. And I got my PhD at University of Florida in performance psychology. And um, in the last 22 years, I've been a professor at Austin Peay State University teaching, performance psychology, sports psychology, classes like that. Um, so what's, what's interesting about today's talk is, you know, it's like a 360 approach. Not only did I play, not only do I know the research, not only do I consult with uh, professional and collegiate and junior tennis players. So the idea is I'm gonna give you a 360 approach. And I think uh, that's gonna be very important. Uh, so it's not just like hearsay and experiences, there's a lot of scientific background that I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, and, you know, I also worked with, like I was saying, collegiate teams. One thing Don didn't say was uh, I worked with the Vanderbilt um, men's team and they went to the NCAA championships about 10 years ago. But I've also worked with a lot, a lot of other collegiate uh, teams as well, which has been great experiences. And I'll, I'll share a few of those with you uh, tonight. Uh, and when people find out um, that I'm a sports psychologist, I always get usually these two same questions. One is, what percentage of tennis is uh, mental? Is it 40%, 30%, 80%? Well, what I like to say is tennis is 100% mental, 100% physical. You can't tease one from the other because when you're thinking bad, you're playing bad, and you get this downward spiral, they're totally connected. But when you're thinking good, you start playing better, and you start thinking even better, you get this upward spiral. So they're, they're totally interconnected. The problem is, I know you know this, uh, that 
that the mental game is really important. That's why you're on this webinar with me tonight. But the thing is, is most people don't know what to work on. You know, when they're, they, let's say they had a really bad uh, serving day, they might think it's their motion. And so they go out and they practice, you know, their, their tennis motion, but it might've been their mental game. Maybe they got real nervous and their muscle and their shoulder tightened up. And that's why they were double faulting all day long. And so tonight it's my goal uh, to uh, help you to learn what to work on so that you, you can raise your game, which relates to the, the second question I always get. And it's this, why do some people with so much talent, because you have talent, I have talent, everybody has talent, but there's some people that have talent and why can't they raise their game? And basically uh, I'd say it like this, some people have mental juice which pushes their talents down and they could never play their best under pressure. But there's other players who have the right mental juice and they could raise their game under pressure. They could perform in the storm is what I like to say. Um, and a way to explain that, and I like to do this in my class is with this orange, right? So first question, if I squeeze this orange, what comes out? Orange juice, right? Orange juice always comes out. Second question, why? Why does orange juice come out? Because that is what's inside. What have you put inside? This is the third question. If you put in fear and negativity and doubt, that's what comes out when you get squeezed. Because we all get squeezed on the tennis court. We all get squeezed in life. That's the human condition. But the great players, they put in joy and peace of mind and calmness and confidence. And so when they get squeezed, they can raise their game. And so it's really my goal tonight to show you how to put in the right mental juice. And I know a lot of you are coaches as well, to show you how to help your players put in the right mental juice with the right strategies, with the right, um, activities uh, and all, all that important stuff. Um, and so this, this webinar is not just a lot of, um, let's say scientific uh, know-how, it's also a lot of applied activities to help you to raise your game, to help your students to raise their game under pressure. And um, what, what I like to do uh, and the way I like to think is uh, 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 an overall framework. And so you know how the pieces fit. And so for my 30 years of basically being a sports psychologist, um, I've created this thing called the MAP Mental Game System. Okay, of course that's an acronym. M stands for you are your best model, right? You can't copy Rafa's mental game. You can't copy uh, um, Roger uh, Federer's mental game or Serena Williams. Now they have great mental games, but you have to basically know what makes you tick. And then you got to figure out what makes you tick and move in that direction, which relates to the second part of the map mental game system. And it's, you have to basically attune or become aware of your strengths and what you do right. That's one of the secrets of sports psychology is Focus on what you do right and move in that direction. Now, the irony is when you focus on what you do wrong and why you choked and all that bad stuff, it puts your focus in that direction and it causes problems. Now, I'm not saying deny that and not focus on that, but I'm saying primarily focus on what you do right and so that you will move in that direction. Your energy will go in that direction, which relates to the third part is that once you figure out what you do right because you know yourself, then you create these positive effective habits, not only at home, but on the tennis court. Now that's really important is that a lot of this stuff we're going to talk about is, is off the tennis court, so you can bring it on the tennis court, but it's ultimately these positive effective habits because we know in psychology, when you get squeezed, you go to your habits under pressure. And so it's all about creating positive effective habits so that you can perform in the storm, so that you can help your players perform in the storm, because it's all about playing your best under pressure, right? That's all what we want to do. We want to play our best when it counts. So what I want to do tonight is
talk about how um, these five, what I call keys, fit in with the map mental game system. So the first one is you have to know yourself, right? And that's the key. Uh, you have to know what makes you tick and what, why you play your best. Um, you also know, you have to know how to uh, gain your confidence when you lose it. You have to know that you're gonna be nervous, but you can harness that energy uh, of nervousness and anxiety. You have to be in the moment and you have, we call that focus. And then you have to be inspired to practice. So I'm gonna talk about those five keys tonight. Um, and, and, and focus uh, um, on some strategies to help you and help to help your students uh, enhance those five mental keys. So let me talk about the first one. So I don't know if you saw this match, but Osaka is playing Coco Goff. It's the US Open, it's the third round. And um, you know, uh, the media is hyping Coco Goff as this huge teen sensation. And you know, she's, she's playing great at the time. Um, and uh, actually, Osaka knows her, and they're friends. Um, and she got really, um, her intensity level was, was really, she was really pumped up, right? Uh, and she played some of her best tennis I saw all year. I know she won the Australian Open earlier in the year, but she didn't play that well. And then this match, she just played fantastic. And what happened in the next round? She lost. Well, what that tells me is, for Osaka to play her best, if you look at intensity level, let's say 100 is, is the highest, zero is, is flat, and you go with like a 10-point scale, she probably has to play her best when she's at 90 or 80, and now she has to figure out how to get there. Now, that's not the same for everybody. You might need to play your best at 40. You might need to play your best at 70. But the secret is, going back to the map mental game system, figure out what makes you play your best and then move in that direction. So what I typically do when I work with uh, tennis players is I ask them these basic questions. Now, I don't uh, use a psychology test. You don't need a psychology test uh, to know what makes you play your best. But these are like some fundamental questions that are really going to help uh, you and help you coach your players better. So one is, ask your players, for instance, when you played your best, what were you thinking and feeling? Were you nervous? Were you confident? What was, what was, was there anything different? Were you playing a, a friend? Were you playing a mortal enemy? Uh, were you, uh, was your uh, friends in the stands? Were your parents not in the stands? Whatever it is, usually ask, you know, uh, and, and, and have them basically remember a few times when they were in the zone and try to get patterns. Now, again, you want to also look at why they played their worst and, and, and figure, you know, some things out there. And I'm not saying just disregard that, but focus more on when they're playing their best. I think that's really important. And the question is figuring out the why. Why did you play your best? What was it about this situation that made you play your best? Because once you figure out the why, you can move in the right direction. And the why question relates to other things like, uh, why did you have peace of mind that, that game, that match? Why were you totally confident that match? Uh, why have you been inspired to practice and compete? So knowing your why is really important so you can move in that direction. And knowing your students' why helps you to push them in the right direction. So I'm going to move on to another key. Now, let me just say, um, at the end, we're going to open up for some questions. So I know you have a lot of questions. Uh, and feel free to uh, pepper me. Um, with, with any questions you want. I was actually speaking to eight-year-old uh, tennis players at a, a tennis camp uh, about a year, two years ago. And, you know, if you talk to eight-year-olds, um, they, they, you know, they're like totally like staring at you for 20 minutes. And I finally said, you guys have any questions? Do you have any questions? And finally, this kid in the back row, he starts jumping up. Uh, and I like, what is he? he goes, uh, you know, you look just like Will Ferrell. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, I have that one already. But the idea is that I love your questions. So, so make sure you pepper me with a bunch of questions later on. Okay, so with that being said, um, number two, confidence is, is, is a choice. Now, when I work with young, uh, young, young tennis players, um, the one thing I always say is, you know, a lot of times that train is gonna leave the station. You're gonna, you're gonna play bad and you're gonna lose confidence. One of the hardest things to do is get that confidence back. But Confidence is a choice. That is your power. 
um, you can always choose to be confident. It doesn't matter if you just double faulted four times in a row. It doesn't matter if you dump three uh, volleys in the net. You can still choose to be confident. Now, one of my favorite examples of this is with Serena Williams. Now, this is not hearsay. She actually wrote about this. Um, and she talks about, she's playing a doubles match with her sister Venus. You know, they won a lot of matches, a lot of tournaments together. And one day they're playing and Venus is just out of it. She doesn't care and they're losing. And Serena said, look, Venus, I'm here to compete. I'm here to win and we're gonna win. Now, now I'm paraphrasing, but the idea is that Serena Williams chose to be confident. And that's what makes her such a great champion because she chose to be confident. And that's what champions do. They always choose to be confident. No matter how bad they're playing, that is their choice. And, and make sure your students know that. Empower them by telling them you always can choose to be confident and make the right choice. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that, and everybody who's played tennis knows this, during a, a set, during a match, your game goes up and down, up and down. Uh, there'd be games, even a set, where you stink. But when you're stinking, you can still choose to be confident. And once you choose to be confident, you get right back up and you can basically start winning again. But once you doubt yourself and you lose your confidence, that's when you can take that total dive and, and, and typically sometimes get into a slump. So you gotta know your game goes up and down and when it's going on that downward slide, choose to be confident. It's really important and that'll help you get right back up. So of course it's easier said than done to choose to be confident when you're playing really bad. So I wanna tell you four main ways to choose to be confident. Now, we just talked about um, with Serena Williams, what you say, it's self-talk. It's also what you think, imagery, which we're gonna talk about, how you act, and what you do, your accomplishments. Now, before I move on, I wanna ask you a question. Out of these four, which one is most important to your confidence? Which one contributes most to your confidence? What do you think? Now, to answer this question, I'll give you a, a good example. I'm five foot eight. I tell myself, I can dunk a basketball. I can dunk, I can dunk. I visualize, visualize myself dunking over and over and over again. And I, I say, I can dunk, I act like I can dunk. I can never dunk, I can never dunk. There's no way, I can't even touch the net. So what you do is the most important, that's the meat. The other three are real important, but what you do is the most important. And of course, if you're close, then the other three, work like if you're you know you're serving and you can make serves well the other three are going to work um so i want to focus on number four real quickly but not not emphasize too much of it and it's really when we're working with kids you know the idea is baby steps right get them to serve on the <clears throat> excuse me on the t line so they gain confidence and then and then move back and back and and the idea is baby steps builds confidence but i really want to focus on some other ones now what you say is really kind of one of the keys. It's like the key of maybe all of the mental toughness secrets I tell you, right? Self-talk. Um, you got to be your best friend. Uh, when I was younger uh, and I was playing tennis, I always had to say, I'm bringing my A game. I'm bringing my A game. I am bringing my A game, which meant I'm going to be prepared and I'm going to be ready. And when I'm playing, I'm going to stay with it. I'm bringing my A game. And that really helped me to compete. Now, what's cool about it is that throughout my life, I'd always make that saying. When I went to a um, quiz or a test in college, I'm bringing my A game. And when I go speak, I'm bringing my A game. And so what's cool about tonight is that we're not really just talking about mental toughness for tennis. The strategies we're talking about will help you in life and everything in life, right? The self-talk, when you, when you get into a habit of self, positive self-talk, it's not just going to help you on the tennis court. It's going to help you every avenue of your life. And so you gotta create these habits early so that it becomes a habit for everything you do. Now, bringing your A game might not be what you wanna say. That's going back to the map mental game. You gotta figure out what makes you tick. Um, and so the idea is uh, when I ask people, tennis players, uh, you know, uh, recall a time when you were in the zone, um, and, and, and describe it on a piece of paper. And I have them usually label words, like, like usually emotionally charged words. 
Those are the words that I think usually can be their buzzwords for the self-talk to get them pumped up, like find your fire. I remember I was working with a Vanderbilt tennis player. That's what he loved to see, you know, find my fire. And he would hit his knee before a knee, his thigh before, you know, slightly before a, like, a, let's say return of serve. The idea is that was really good or, or, or be at peace, you know, whatever it is, you got to find out what words make you tick and move in the right direction. And so, yeah, that's the North Shore of uh, Kauai, if you're wondering. And that would make me, when I wa look at that, make me be at peace. So the idea is when you find words and images and er certain actions, that will help you move in the right direction um, uh, to find that confidence when you need it. So let's talk a little bit about visualization. And before I do, I wanna share with you what I do with my class, and you can do this with your players. Um, it's a really cool um, tech, te uh, let's say, uh, technique. Um, let me move this down a little bit so you can see my hand. There you go. And it showed the visualization show is really about mind-body connection. It, it, really it, it really emphasizes mind-body connection. So what I want to share with you is this. I'm going to visualize this paperclip moving this way. Now, I'm not going to move my hand. I'm just going to visualize the paperclip moving. And you can see it's moving a lot. Look at my hand. My hand's not moving at all. My hand's not moving at all. Isn't that cool? There's a mind-body connection. Uh, and that's cool about all of sports psychology, but with visualization. So like you're about to serve and you see the ball going in, you're going to be calm. You're going to be relaxed. Your shoulder's going to be relaxed. If you see the ball missing, your shoulder might tighten up. And then, of course, you might dump it in the net. Now, I know Novak he says he uses a lot of visualization. That's part of his mental game package. A lot of great players do. Um, so let me tell you a couple things about visualization. The first one is some people have a tough time visualizing, um, but here's what can help. You know, we talk with our hands, we eat with our hands. So you can also help you visualize with your hands. Let's say uh, you're right-handed, you're returning serve, and you think that person's going to hit to your forehand and you want to hit a cross court, you might just do this in your, you know, your routine in your, um, when you're about to return serve and you visualize yourself hitting a cross court. But the idea is that using your hands helps you to visualize. The other thing too is uh, I'll call what I call a golden nugget book. Let's say you just um, uh, nutted a, a, you know, a forehand uh, for a winner down the line, one of your best forehands. You know, after the match, you could write what that felt like. Or you, know, you hit a couple bomb aces in the match, you know, write down what you felt like, who you played, keep that in your tennis book. I mean, keep that in your tennis bag and then look at that, you know, a lot. And it brings up these great visualizations. Um, so you gotta, you have to practice visualization. And the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And the better you get at it, uh, the better it works. So how you act. Now, this is Nick. I'm gonna just get on him a little bit. He's got amazing talent. I love watching this guy play because he's got so much talent. It's crazy. Uh, but we all seen it when an umpire gives him a bad call. Yeah, he's like, he freaks out sometimes. And you can see his body language goes, and it, he's done. He's done. Uh, he's the perfect example of the person who has immense talent, but they have the juice that pushes their talents down. Now, the other guy I love to watch, and it's the flip of this, is Diego Schwartzman. Now, he's so positive. I mean, he's just always so positive. He's got a great mental attitude. Um, he's like David and Goliath. You know, he's five foot five, and he's just, he's just so um, uh, intense, but so good uh, mentally on, on the tennis court um, because he's, he acts so positive. The other thing I just wanted to point out, he always wears his hat backwards, right? Well, after a point, watch this. His hat usually comes up, and uh, the start of the point, he pushes it down, kind of tells them, I'm ready to go. And he does a lot of things that sports psychologists tell their players to do, but he's got a really strong mind. And that's one of the reasons why he's such a great player. Um, and I just want to stop for a minute and tell you um, one of the things uh, about this webinar is it's also uh, sponsored by the International Association of Tennis Psychology. Um, if you go to masteringtennispsychology.com, you can, there's a lot of free videos. There's, there's a whole section on confidence for free. There's a free mental game ebook. Um, but if you want more uh, enhanced knowledge about the mental game, there's these five sections that we're talking about tonight, awareness, confidence, concentration, um, dealing with your anxiety, motivation to compete. And each section has videos, articles, and applied exercises. I, I helped to create this for them. Um, and it, the good news is it's, um, 
three or four credits for continuing education. It's been approved for three or four credits for continuing education for the USPTA. So if you, you're a member, which I think everyone is on this webinar, um, you can take it and actually you get a discount. If you use that promo code USPTA175, you get it for 175 versus 399. So um, again, if you want some enhanced knowledge, uh, you know, you can take the course, but there's a lot of cool free stuff on there as well. So let me move on and let me talk about harnessing the power of anxiety. So uh, 40,000 years ago, when we were hunters and gatherers, uh, we weren't afraid, we were afraid of dying, right? Um, now we're not afraid of dying. Uh, we're afraid of looking foolish, uh, fear of, of letting our parents down. Well, anxiety is always caused from fear, always. So fear basically is the, uh, let's say, the, the starter of anxiety. So it's fear of looking foolish, fear of looking incompetent, fear of look, making mistakes, fear of letting your parents down, your coaches down. That's what's causing all that anxiety, right? Um, and, and going back to the fear factor, well, 40,000 years ago, the way we, we stayed alive in a hostile environment is that fight or flight response. We had a fight or run like heck, right? Well, you know, when you, um, when you fight, you get these hormones, or when you're running, you get these hormones, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, and they can actually make you superhuman. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. You know, have you heard about that lady who picks up the car um, because her kid's underneath? It can happen. Um, and the idea is that these hormones, if they're used correctly, can, can make you um, think better under pressure, can make you um, stronger, run faster, and make you play better. They can make you perform in the storm, is what I say, if you basically allow them to. Uh, and a great example, uh, Billie Jean King wrote a book, Pressure is a Privilege. And what she said in this book is that when I was at Wimbledon, I looked at it like a privilege to be there uh, in the finals. So she labeled her emotions. And that's the secret. How you label your emotions changes how you, uh, you um, let's say, how they, they come out or how you feel about them. So if you label anxiety like a challenge, it becomes a positive experience. If you label anxiety like a privilege, like Billie Jean King was saying, it becomes a positive experience. I say turn pressure into pleasure. When, when you are um, labeling it like exciting or a challenge, you're labeling the pressure and it becomes pleasure. But a lot of people, they flip it around. They turn the pleasure into pressure. They're like playing with their buddies and they should be having fun playing tennis, but all of a sudden they're like, afraid of what their friends are going to think. And now instead of being a pleasurable experience, it becomes total pressure. And usually they tighten up and, and make all those mistakes. So how we label uh, our anxiety changes it and it can move it in the right direction. Because really anxiety is just an energy source. That's all it is. Anxiety is an energy source. And if you label it correctly, effectively, positively, you move it in the right direction. If you label it uh, like I'm going to choke, I uh, can't believe this has happened to me. You go in the wrong direction. So how you label the situation directly impacts your emotions. But I also want to talk about that anxiety is not only just about what you do in your head. It's also what you do in your heart. Um, um, because it's really, there's two components. We call it cognitive anxiety and somatic anxiety. Somatic is body, you know, butterflies and nervousness. And, you know, when you get nervous, uh, some people lose, you know, the saliva. My eyesight goes, yur, 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 and my ears get all tingly. You know, everyone's different. But the idea is that you got to make sure that doesn't overwhelm you because sometimes it, it can overwhelm you. Um, so Bianca, she's talking about meditation in her mental game package. And meditation is so powerful. And let me tell you why it is. And it relates to that last sentence on the slide is that um, if you think about a balancing meter, this is anxiety. And this is what we call meditation or the relaxation response. If you practice relaxation, it can overcome anxiety. But if you don't practice it, anxiety becomes more powerful. So even if you tell yourself, just relax, just relax, you can. So you gotta practice learning to relax. So just a quick thing about meditation is you, you know, at night after a warm shower, you sit in a chair and you just close your eyes, take some deep breaths, Relax your toes. Just think about relaxing your toes. Relax your calves, your thighs, your abdominal muscles, your chest, your shoulders, 
your chin, your forehead, top of your head. Do it for five, 10 minutes and you know, focus on your breathing. Just, just think about your breathing. That's all you gotta do. In about two or three weeks, it's, it's gonna be real effective. What's even more effective is once you do your breathing and you're, you maybe say a word like cool or smooth, that word gets associated with that calm state and you bring that onto the tennis court. Remember we talked about the map mental game system? A lot of stuff you do off the tennis court, you bring onto the tennis court. Well, once you learn to meditate and bring, you know, your relaxed state with that word, you can use it at the start of your, um, your service routine, okay, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is um, it's really powerful, but you got to practice it. But it's more than just performance. I'll tell you a really cool story. So I was teaching uh, and, and at Austin P and, and I was teaching a sports psych and, and at the start of every class for five minutes, we do meditation, every class, five minutes. And I had this gentleman who uh, was in the war in Afghanistan and he had post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Which how could you not if you're in the war, right? And you've seen combat. And uh, after about five weeks, he emails me and he said, you know, when I started class, my mind was really foggy. And then after I started meditating for about five weeks, the fog is cleared. I thought, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, med we know meditation is very helpful for your health. So, again, it's really important for performance, but it's also really important for your health. I've been doing it for 30, 40 years. Uh, and it's really beneficial. So I want to talk about number four, be in the moment. I have to admit that my favorite player is Rafa. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but let me tell you, I have a saying that says success leaves clues. If you look at what he does, he does a lot of stuff for a reason. And um, one of the things that he does, and he said he's done this, is he plays each point at the same intensity level. Let's say at 90 out of 100. You know, you can't typically play at 100, but you play at 90. And the idea is that if you focus on your intensity level and not the score, your emotions don't go like this. If you focus on your intensity level, you can keep your emotions like this. So he plays the same, the first point, like he does match point. And so he doesn't, there's no emotional involvement. He can play at the highest level. You, I get this question a lot with tennis um, coaches. Why did my player choke um, coming down the stretch? You know, he, he couldn't close out the match. Well, the reason we don't close out matches in tennis is because we start thinking about outcome and winning. And, and you start tightening up. But if you let go of those outcome thoughts and you're in the moment, you're in the process, and one of the best ways to do that is focus every point at the same intensity level like Rafa does, you can, you can close out matches a lot easier. So I wanna talk about another thing related to concentration is the pre-shot routine, right? Pre-serve routine, the routine before you um, hit return shots. Uh, and a lot of people, have, you know, you've heard about the pre-shot routine, but it's a lot more involved than you think it is. It's not just what you do, right? Uh, to me, the best routine has the three R's, being relaxed, having a reactive mind, and also promoting rhythm. But ultimately, let me explain what a routine does. It's almost like a bubble that you put around yourself when you have the right routine. And the bubble allows the pressure not to come in. It like bounces off because you have the right mental and emotional set to create this amazing routine. So let me tell you in his example, um, what I think is a great routine. You start being relaxed, you breathe out, maybe say your word, you practice you know, your meditation at home and you breathe out and say the word smooth, right? That's the starting routine. Let's say when you're serving, you shrug your shoulders, they get the tension, right? And then you look at the spot, you're just thinking about the spot you're gonna serve to. And that's what I call the reactive mind. You're not thinking about your motion, you're thinking about the spot. I know when you're, when you're um, thinking about the motion, that's what we call analytical thoughts. And analytical thoughts, I know you've heard this term paralysis by analysis. When we overthink, we freeze up. So you've got to let go of those analytical thoughts and focus on your target. That's the reactive mind. Or we call that the play box. Now, if you're coming up to the service line, maybe you want to think about your motion. But once you're at the service line and you start your routine, you got to think about just where you're hitting your serve. And then... Uh, rhythm. Now I have this guy, Roger Federer, because I mean, his serve rhythm is, is amazing. And what people I think don't appreciate is the routine that you do. Uh, I'm sorry, the rhythm that you use in your routine promotes rhythm of your service motion. 
So if your routine's fast, your service motion's gonna be fast and it might throw you off. And we all know the greatest servers have a beautiful routine, uh, I'm sorry, beautiful rhythm, right? And that helps them be consistent under pressure. So you might have one and two and go, whatever it is, you gotta figure out works for you, but do it every time. I know when I, I, I'm old and I was growing up, Johnny Mack, Johnny McEnroe was um, my favorite player to watch and emulate as a serve. And he'd go up and then come down and go up and come down a little farther and then come up and then, and then make a serve. I mean, it was beautiful. He's such an artist. Um, and he, his rhythm was amazing. And it made me appreciate have a very rhythmical routine. And that's what you got to promote in your students. Have a rhythmical routine because that's going to promote a rhythmical serve. The other thing I want to say is if you bounce the ball three times, always bounce it three times. So when you're playing with your buddies, bounce it three times so that when you're in a match, you bounce it three times. Because what happens a lot of times, you're under pressure. Instead of three times, you might bounce it four times or five times. And that tells your body, uh-uh, something's wrong here, and you tighten up. So you got to figure out how many times you're going to bounce it and do it the same way. Consistency uh, promotes being relaxed. So it's really important to be consistent in your routine. And we also know something about a routine is the time element's always the same. So if you took out a stopwatch and did Federer's routine, it'd almost be exactly the same amount of time every serve. Guaranteed, try it. That's what great players do. Their routine is the same time element. Because if you slow down or speed up, that's going to throw off your rhythm. So I also want to talk about um, a post-shot routine, letting go. So Ken Flack, I don't know if you remember that name, Flack and Suguso. They were a great doubles team. They won Wimbledon, U.S. Open, and a gold medal in 1988. Uh, Ken Flack was the coach at Vanderbilt when I worked with his team for about four or five years. Great guy, even better coach. One thing he told me was what he did after every point was – walk up the doubles alley after the point, not walk, you know, in the middle, always the doubles alley. That was a way of kind of his release of letting it go. Um, you got to let go uh, of some negativity. So I'm going to sh share with you a little, little um, visualization. See this airplane? I'm going to throw it. There you go. What if that airplane had like a bunch of pennies on it in the middle? What would it do? <sighs> Crash and burn, right? Well, that's what you're going to do when you got a lot of negative thoughts from uh, the previous point, just like this guy right here. It's a lot of like negative baggage you carry to the next point. You got to figure out ways to let go. So like with Ken Flack, he walked up the doubles alley. Maybe you can just brush it off. Maybe you can, you know, play with your strings. Maybe you could brush it off and say next point, whatever it is, you, you got to figure out what works for you. I, I can't tell you what works for you or works for your players. They have to figure out what works for them, but they got to do it. They got to have a mental and physical trigger to let go and move on to the next point so they can be totally in the moment. Another key point, and this relates a lot to the map. Remember I was talking about what you do off the tennis court really impacts what you do on? Well, the same thing uh, about this slide is the epitome of that. We all are multitaskers. We do three or four things at once. I bet there's a few of you watching me as you're watching your phone, right? That's multitasking, get off your phone. Okay, so the idea is that when you do two or three things at once, you're practicing being distracted. And so that when you come on the tennis court, how can you focus? Because all day long you've been practicing being distracted. But if you're totally engaged in that moment, and for example, you come home and your son talk, comes to you and talks to you about your so their soccer game, and you're totally engaged in that moment, then you're in the moment, you're practicing being in the moment. But if your mind wanders about what you have to do back in the office or back on the tennis court, whatever it is, you're practicing being distracted. But once you practice being in the moment all the time, whether you're at school, at home, then when you get to the tennis court, you can be totally engaged in the moment. So what we do off the tennis court, especially with concentration, really impacts us what we do on the tennis court in terms of focus. So when we create positive, effective habits in all, all things, but you know, especially with concentration, that will transfer to the tennis court under pressure. So the last key I want to talk about is how to be inspired to compete in practice. Well, if you look, what I love about Rafa and Roger is they have this growth mindset. Uh, they're always, I know Roger, um, Rafa said, every time I go practice, I have 
something I'm working on. That's, you know, the growth mindset. Uh, and he's been working on a lot of things. Think about when he started tennis on the tour in terms of the serve and how good it is now. I mean, he's gotten so much better. And Roger's been working on his backhand. Um, the idea is that you got to have a growth mindset. I think everybody knows that. But what I don't think people know, and this is from my, actually my dissertation, and I've written a bunch of articles on this, is you also have to have a champion mindset. It's from the achievement goal theory, achievement goal theory. You got to have both to balance it. You have to have, believe you, you always want to get better, but you also need to compete and practice and compete. Um, because really competition is almost like a laboratory. It's a pressure cooker that allows you to see your mistakes. Uh, and once you compete, you can then go back and practice. And it's also the, if you don't compete, how can you, you know, you're not going to have really that growth mindset, that fire within. There's that balance. You need both. And I think what people don't appreciate is sometimes they just focus on growth, but they're never going to achieve their potential unless they have the, both the champion mindset and the growth mindset. And that's what these two guys do. But, you know, a lot of players do, of course, um, to, to achieve their potential. Because that's the only thing you can ask about yourself is to achieve your potential in tennis and achieve your potential in life. And I also want to talk about practice, practicing with a purpose. Um, and if I ask you, if you ask a group of tennis players, a thousand tennis players, what would the number one gripe complaint be? What do you think? What would the number one complaint be? And they've done a survey and it's this. They can't take their best game from practice to competition. And that's what we call transfer. They can't take their best game from practice to competition. But let me explain it in this principle. Practice is one animal. Competition is a different animal. The farther they are apart, the less you're going to transfer. The closer they are, the more you're going to transfer. So the idea is when you're practicing, when you put pressure on yourself, let's say you got to hit 10 ser first serves in a row. And if you don't, you can't leave the tennis court because by the time you serve that eighth one or ninth one, you're going to feel the pressure or you do, you know, 30, whatever, you know, puts a lot of pressure on you. It's going to basically going to feel more like competition. And in competition, if you actually figure out uh, a great pre-shot routine, you figure out what makes you tick, you figure out how to choose confidence, you figure out how to harness your anxiety and fear, it gets closer. It's never the same, but it's gonna get closer. And the closer you can get these two, the greater the transfer. Because really, that's all we can ask of ourselves, right? And that's all we really wanna do, is perform in the storm. We wanna play our best under pressure. It's great to play with our, you know, when we're just goofing around, but it's so sweet. It is so sweet to play your best when it counts under pressure, right? And it has not only, and it takes the combination of the mind and the body. You got to work on both. And hopefully uh, tonight, I just gave you a little sampling uh, of how to work on both. Now, again, what I was saying is, this is just a sampling. If you want to go in, and I know a lot of you want to go in depth, uh, if you go to Mastering Tennis Psychology, you get some free videos, articles, um, and applied exercises related to confidence and a free uh, mental game ebook. But if you want to go in depth and uh, the five sections all have a lot of videos, articles, and applied exercises, and it's proved by the USPTA for continuing education, you can use that code um, and you know, enjoy the course. Um, and so I think what I'm going to do now is uh, not only uh, tell you um, thank you for joining me tonight, but I'm also going to open it up for questions because I know a lot of you have questions. So I Maybe think, let me un un unmute everybody there. Yeah, did you unmute everybody? No, I can't, you have to do it, I think. Okay, let me just see. Um, You're the host for this one. It says mute all. Yeah, they should say unmute oh, all. Oh yeah, so, you, so people can uh, unmute now. So if people wanna ask a question, they can unmute. I'm pretty sure, let me just make sure I did that right. Yeah, okay. So if they wanna ask a question, they can unmute. So what do you think? I hey, Greg. I... This is Phyllis. How are you? I'm, oh, I'm known as Phil. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Sure. Um, I loved it. Thank you so much. And I think it's so needed. Uh, I'm a high school coach, so it's really, really needed. Um, the toughness, the mental toughness. What I'd like for you to go over just really quickly again for me is practice with a purpose. Because I always tell the girls, let's practice with the purpose. But I'm practicing a particular shot that they would use perhaps in a game. Or I'm practicing something that I saw in a match that would help them. But I want to put the two together like you did, the practice with a purpose with competition. So if you'd go over that really quickly, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, sure. Well, I think you're on the right track. I mean, the, the ultimate thing is it doesn't matter what you do, but when you're in practice, if, you know, you start, let's say, with mastering, you're hitting some forehands, which is fine, and mastering the stroke, but then, but then don't just spend the time on mastery. I would say at least half the time, spend it on um, practicing with a purpose, which is putting pressure, whatever it is, uh, that you got to hit, you know, 10 um, forehands in a row in the court, or are you playing for points against someone else? It, I don't think it really matters as long as there's some competitive pressure element, because when you play a match, it's all competitive. It's all pressure. So the game's going to transfer if you incorporate that into practice. Okay, that's perfect. I usually do say let's do 10 in a row or whatever, but I need to add it. This is like competition. This is the pressure that you're going to feel in competition. So I think that will help them with their mindset on that. Right. I also think what's real important is to explain the why. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. doing this because it's really hard for your game to transfer. So if you want to play your best in competition, this is how we do it. So you explain the meaning of the, the, um, the activity. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, any more questions from anybody? Hello, everyone. This is Natalia. I would like to ask a question. Can, can okay, you hear ahead. me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so my question is, I'm working with the professional tennis player, and we got to the point that I am keep tracking her pulse because um, on the physical activity, she can handle very well. The moment I get a little bit more stressful situation, the pulse going very high, like we're talking about like a 180, to the point that the player cannot breathe. And at first I thought maybe it's kind of a physical element, uh, but now I see it's more with the stressful situation. Uh, her pulse go up and she cannot breathe to the point she needs to just go on the bench. So my question to you, I know it's kind of probably need more details, but uh, my question is, what is the tools you can recommend how a player can pass that stage where uh, literally feeling like, you know, she choked? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and, and, and focusing on uh, pulse, I know a lot of uh, sports psychologists do that, you know, they, uh, especially between points, they want to get their pulse down um, and they, they measure pulse. Um, and it, you know, it depends on the person also figuring out what their pulse is when they're playing their best. So everybody's unique because yeah. not, you can't say you need to be at this number, but they got to figure out when they're playing their best, what number they're at. But with your, with your student, she's developed a bad habit. It's, it's, um, it's called classical conditioning. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but what, ha what has happened is under pressure, her heart rate goes up, her pressure, uh, her blood pressure goes up, her pulse goes up. It's been um, conditioned uh, for her. And so you got to uncondition her. And probably the best strategy is to do the meditation with her, um, to make her practice meditation off the tennis court, figure out a word. And when she feels her, her, her heart rate going up, she can say her word and, you know, and get it back down. The other thing I would do with her is when she meditates, visualize herself uh, under pressure being real calm. So as she's meditating, one of the part, so let her, let her meditate for five or 10 minutes, but she's got to get good at it first and then do some visualization. Yeah. And the visualization she could use is see herself playing some really tough points under pressure, but she's seen herself being really, really calm. And that combination is going to be very helpful. 
Yeah, I think it's like a sum of the tool that's like I got to the point. I like how you mentioned pulse is super important. And that's where I started uh, trying to figure out the pattern with different, different physical activities. And then that's where I see the pulse is not the consistent depends on what she does. So, and I was, uh, we got to the point that I said, you know, you probably need to kind of uh, draw some pictures or, or print the pictures and put as a keychain on your back, uh, on your racket case, that when you feel that anxiety and fear, you might go through a few pictures to remind you how you need to relax. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, okay, I, those, uh, I, thank you very much. I, 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 I like that. Complex. I mean, that, I think what mm -hmm. you're doing, yeah, it's, it's a complex issue. Um, but going back, you know, the anxiety response is real powerful. The relaxation response becomes, can, over, it can um, actually be more powerful when you practice it. But she hasn't practiced it, so her anxiety response be, overwhelms her. So you got to get her to be really proficient at the relaxation response so that it can become more powerful than the anxiety response. And once she does that, then this issue will be, it might not always go, it might not go away, but it'll be greatly diminished. Yeah, I appreciate. I, I, we kind of got to the buzzword. I like how you said buzz. It's, it's a good word for me to use it. Buzzword. I said switch. I said, you need to work on the switch. That switch needs to be pretty fast. It's like one or two points, but don't let yourself work on your switch a few games. So it's, it's a good to label that as a buzzword. Okay. I appreciate. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I think you're on the right track. I'm just trying to give you a couple more tools. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be back to you with that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any more questions from anybody? Um, one question came up on the chat box is, do you know about a, oh, a certain watch or a way to take care of the pulse, uh, Dr. Steinberg? Yeah, well, that's what uh, Natalia, I think, was talking about. Yeah, you could wear a watch. Um, I, I don't know the technology enough. I mean, cause it, it changes all the time, but watches can take your pulse, whatever. I think monitoring pulse is, is really important in tennis. Um, because you, uh, if people's pulse, um, you know, there, there's a framework that you got to get in for your pulse. And if it gets out of that, let's say framework, they're going to choke. But every, someone's pulse might be this like Bjorn Borg, you know, he, he was way down here. John Macro's up here. So the idea is you got to figure out what the pulse is for you and for your player. So, so it gets a little tricky and that's why uh, awareness is key and figuring out what pulse for them is key uh, and don't make it standard across the board for everybody. Uh, Dr. Steinberg, I have uh, a quick question. I think it's a quick question <laughs> to ask you. Um, I just started working with uh, a 14 year old that uh, is a highly ranked junior um, starting to play a lot of the um, top national tournaments and that type of thing. And one of the things that's kept her from uh, growing a little bit faster in the game is um, she is an absolute perfectionist and she has great difficulty with any kind of positive reinforcement for anything that she's done well because she feels like that's what she's supposed to do you know she's she's a uh, i would call her a workaholic the i guess she, she just loves playing and practicing with a purpose she does a lot of these things very well and we've been focusing on reminding her of of these things like uh, as you have suggested in your in your chat today but I wanted to kind of try to find a way that I can help her be a little bit more accountable in terms of the, the homework and the things that, we're, that, that I'm asking her to do. And um, she is just 14, but again, she's, she's you know, been around the block, so she knows what the competition is like and that it's only gonna get um, stronger and stronger. So uh, I just didn't know if you had come across kids like that and if you had any just general quick suggestions to help hold them accountable sure well let me let me address it this way and it, that the issue you're having with your players is common it happens a lot with a lot of players but going back to um 
I think the, the philosophy, which is my philosophy is this, we're not talking about mental toughness just for tennis, right? We're talking about strategies for life, right? We're talking about um, you're really, as a coach, not only you're helping players become better tennis players, but you're helping uh, them develop strategies so that they are more successful and happier in their life. Well, with this, this young girl you're talking about, I guarantee you she's a perfectionist in every part of her life. You're hundred um, percent correct. <laughs> yeah. 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 So you got to work on, if you just work on perfectionism on the tennis court, it's never going to work. You got to focus on perfectionism in all parts of her life and, and understand that it's okay not to get a hundred on the test. You know, and if you study, you miss a few, you learn from your mistakes um, and you learn from your failures. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but the idea is that you, you must, and work with her parents as well, work on that it's, 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 you strive for excellence, not for, not for perfection. You strive only for excellence because um, perfection is, is unattainable and it can create serious problems. So you gotta go across the board in all avenues of her life. Now going back to what you okay. can do on the tennis court and in life is you know, what I call this thing about failing forward. You know, talk about failure, making mistakes, and what you learn from that. Because she's so afraid of making mistakes. She's so afraid of failing. That's why she's a perfectionist. It's a great fear. So if, she's a, if she starts embracing mistakes and failures as a way to learn and as a way for growth, she's going to be less of a perfectionist. Yes, I, I agree with you. We, we've talked a lot about the process and not the outcome. And um I think it's starting to make headway. And I've just, I think the, the biggest thing I'm trying to impart on her, is the, these are skills that you have to practice as much as you practice your, you know, uh, 500 forehands down the line and the, the backhands cross court and, you know, all those types of things that she has to own it. And, and so I was just trying to, to help her take it as seriously as, uh, you know, and help her believe that, with her commitment to it that she will you know be able to open up those floodgates of opportunity and and feel a little more successful uh, I, think, I think you hit upon something good too is like perfectionism has a lot to do with outcome so focus on mastery and growth and and emphasize that make sure parents emphasize that and she'll be when you're focusing less on outcome you, you'll be less of a perfectionist because mastery you can't be a perfectionist in mastery because you're always getting better so focus on mastery would be, I think, a key ingredient like you're doing. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have another question. It's Natalia. Go ahead, but Natalia. I, um, do you think it's okay? Sure. All right. I appreciate that. Um, okay. I think the topic is confident game versus a strategy. Um, uh, strategy, I mean, just looking on the other side, looking at the opponent and try to find these weaknesses that you can use your confident game and also have kind of some sort of free points. So, and again, we, we're talking about the high level uh, player. Um, so we got to the point that like, okay, you need your powerful game, serve, volley, um, in intense points, two, four shots. And uh, I labeled that, okay, uh, it's 80% of that. And how we can work 20% as a strategy when you come in and you don't have your best, best game and you need to figure out how to make your life easier on the tennis court. Um, so that's probably, I don't know if it's a, so the question is, how do you see maybe in the percentage level, how much I need to bring on the court, my confident game, uh, even not at my best day versus strategy. Do you think it's a question or it's already too much? <laughs> no, I kind of, I kind of understand what you're saying. You know, of course the, the best um, mental game is be, uh, be confident to conservative uh, targets, which is, you know, you want to be real aggressive yeah. through the shot to, um, to conservative targets, but and I think stay this, calm. Yeah. And yeah. Stay but I think, I think you're confident you're, about it. Yeah. yeah. I think what you're talking about also is like, you know, if you're trying to hit a forehand down the line to the corner, uh, the percentage is low. Um, and so 
the idea is if you, you want to stay confident, you, your, your targets have to be a, a little less um, severe. Uh, but when you're, you know, you could say like, if you go out, I'm talking about, I'm, now I'm talking about strategy, about mental game stuff that you're illustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that when, you're, right. when your confidence is not so high, what you want to do is make your targets less um, uh, severe, make them more conservative and you'll gain more confidence. So then you can start going for the lines. See what I'm saying? So the idea is if your player is not that confident that day, well, if they just pound their uh, forehand down the middle, they're going to start getting confident because it's building you know, up it's a percentage building. and then they could start going for the lines once they get in the confidence. So I think the secret is you could tell your player, okay, if when your confidence is 80%, you know, don't go for the lines, but when it gets to 90%, you start real good. Then we can make our targets a little um, more severe or, you know, whatever you okay, want to call I, it more aggressive. I hear it's like more building up and go from there. So, but don't go on the edge if right. you start didn't pass that confident zone right. okay i'll give you another question another example so during the match for example i'm more player as a strategy i want to see how you playing that back in open stand or close stand and then if you're missing a lot on the open stand then i'm going to start pulling you to the corner because i want that free point or i want you to give you i want you to give me that easy ball so that's what another kind of depth of the strategy and my player saying, well, when I'm going to start thinking and looking on the other side, it's really throwing off my game. This way, my player is in fear even to go there because yeah. so afraid to lose the confidence in, in, its, in, in uh, her own game. So, Well, I think she's how, talking about o overthinking. You know, well, what you're talking it's about is out of a comfort zone. It's yeah. like well, I want a little deeper, and it's a little resistant. About, yeah, you're talking about mm -hmm. tennis is like a chess game, right? It, it's like yeah, it's like after this shot, you should hit. And so it's yeah. not just one. Sh she she she's comfortable with one shot. You know, one versus one. You want to play like three three shots ahead, like a chess. You know, if you're Kind of. Yes. Uh, not, and I don't want to push it. That's what I I labeled that as twenty percent. I don't want to say, would, "Wow, yeah. that's going to be fifty percent of your game." No, well, but twenty fifteen, I think it's reasonable. Yeah. Well, let me let me go back to you know. Remember we talked about the map mental game system. Yes. What what makes you tick? So you're analytical. You like think, thinking three four moves ahead. Some players just want to react. They just want to not even think a move ahead. Just totally react to the one shot. That's where she's mm -hmm. at. She's she's more okay. of what we call the right brain. Um, you are more, I could tell, in the left. You're more left brain. You're analytical. You like to think three or four shots. And ahead. lefty. <laughs> yeah, she's not like that. So if you force that on her, she she's 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 blocking you. So let her be who she is. Figure out what makes her move in the right direction. She's more reactive. You got to emphasize that. If you try oh, to yeah. emphasize overthinking she she's gonna um not like it and she's not gonna play her best that's what she's telling so me. i guess the question back is it 15 percent to develop that game is it too much or <laughs> See, we just need to let it go and, and you're saying 15 percent you're, you're you're analytical don't even give percentages yeah okay. just you just gotta she's totally reactive i could tell what you're uh, talking about she just and wants to thank react you. and yeah. she need to let her go I mean, okay. in terms of not, I don't mean let her go as a client. I mean, as a. No, no, no. I know. I understand. Yeah, you need let to let, let her be idea. who she is and be rea a lot more. Focus on her strengths. Remember, we talked about the map mental game system. Her Absolutely. strength is yeah. uh, um, being reactive. So figure out how to enhance that. And that's what's going to make her the best player. Okay. Thank you. I know too much time, guys. I'm so sorry. Everyone. No, that was a great question. I, okay. So mute. Uh, Thank you, Natalia. And uh, I want to mention to everybody before you all leave here is uh, if you go to ESPN2 right now, World Team Tennis is on where the San Diego Aviators are playing the Philadelphia Freedom. So if you're bored this afternoon, uh, coronavirus has you cooped up inside, go watch uh, some World Team Tennis on ESPN2. Uh, Dr. Steinberg, I want to thank you for your time today. That was very informative, very good information. I think everybody just loved it. I'm going to send them my reaction here. So it's a hand clap. And uh, thank you for doing that. Any, anything last words you want to bring up? 
No, I'm good. I think uh, hopefully, you know, people, um, I know it's tough working on the mental game. Um, and, you know, again, the secret is, the ultimate secret is figure out what you or what your players, um, what makes them tick. Not, and don't have a standard across the board and individualize that mental game for every player and it's going to make them so much better so that they can perform in the storm. But again, it's definitely been a pleasure and honor um, having me uh, speak to your group. So again, thank yes. you so much, Don. And one person that asked about, do you have any books that you can recommend, authors or any books that you can recommend? I know you have uh, written uh, three different books at least. Yeah, there's any? a book called... Um, uh, he's a famous uh, ten, uh, sports psychologist, tennis player um, for tennis, um, Jim uh, Allaire. Um, I always liked his stuff, but he has a book I really liked. It's called Stress for Success. To me, it's always, um, it's been a, it's a great book. It's called Stress for Success by Jim Lair. Uh, and he's worked with a lot of tennis players, some famous tennis players. Um, L-O-E-H-R is his last name spelling. Um, Jim Lair, um, Stress for Success is a great book. Yeah, he's a good man. He's been at many USPTA functions. Yeah, so yeah. So everybody knows him. But I'm saying that book is, is by, I, think, I think, by far his best book. Yeah, great. Okay, I want to thank you again. And I guess we'll wrap it up for today. And we will have this recording uh, available. I'll send it out in an e-blast to our members. And I'm sure uh, Jack will send out something of a recording. And so, um, you know, share it with people if you like. Thanks All a right. lot, Greg. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye.